is wonderful to see so many people, and it's great to be at Strata. It always is, and there's always so many fantastic innovations that we're seeing. It's always so great to see so many old friends. It's good to see the companies that have been around for a while and watch them grow and mature, and to see the new companies as well. And that's all the good news. The good news is that we have more data than ever before. We can do great new things with it that we never could before. But the problem is that it leads to a whole host of problems issues with which society is totally unprepared. We have heard many people talk about the technology. We've heard many people talk about the business.、Uh, I'm not here from the government, but I'm here to help you. I'm here to talk about the state. I'm here to talk about regulation. Now, the government has been involved in big data for a long time. Okay. The census was a big data problem, and it was solved with the big data technologies of the era. That's Herman Hollerith, and that's the Hollerith machine used in the 1880s census. It was a way with which、uh, the government, U.S. government, had realized that a country growing by leaps and bounds needed a new way to tabulate and understand how to count all of the people in the in the country. So useful for for things like representation and taxation. But the state has been involved in technology for far longer than that. They've taken a very great interest in technology. Obviously, the Gutenberg Press seemed to be usher in、uh, a information, a data deluge, a big data and information overload of an earlier era. And of course, they created censorship laws to protect us from、uh, too much of a good thing, too much data. Marconi and his transmitter was another example of a great innovation that led to a cornucopia of information. Yet there again, too, regulators walked in, and there it was about the scarcity of radio spectrum and frequencies that had to be allocated correctly. Nevertheless, the long arm of the state touched the technology, and things always evolved on that basis. Since then. And of course, the internet, which seems to route around government and treat censorship as a as a structural flaw and get the packets to where you want to go, in fact, was in part created via government largess. That's a map of the ARPANET. It stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It used to be the DARPA, but they, after Vietnam, they thought the defense part of the Defense Department's research program should、uh, be rebranded. And of course, they have always been involved with it, and they're involved now. It seems like it's a way to get around governments, but governments use the intermediaries of the internet service providers to regulate it. In this community, you folks look like pioneers. You look like navigators in the great age of navigation, exploring new fields with big data. Then again, if we think about what it was like in the 16th century, maps at the time were the purview of the state and were matters of national security. If you were a map maker and you tried to go abroad and bring your skills from, say, Holland. To、uh, to Germany, you might be killed. So, what does that mean for us today? You folks are like alchemists. Pardon all of these old uh, uh, analogies. This is where it ends. You folks are like alchemists, and I'm here to tell you, governments don't like alchemy. They don't want to not know something. They really, really want to know how things work. When you look at the history of governments, what they want is constancy, stability. They want to uphold what they perceive to be the public interest, and we want representative government to do that. Thinking about the history, what you see is a few phases. Governments, relative to the technology at the time, they first want to adopt it; they're users of the technology. Secondly, they feel threatened by it, and eventually they want to regulate it. And the implications for you in the room today is that big data firms are going to find that among their biggest challenges will be managing public policy, not just the data sets that come across your spheres. So let's think about it as first government as user. Governments are using big data first to improve public services. There's a lot of efficiency gains to be gotten from it, and they're reaching for it right now. In New York City, as an example, they're using big data, taking in the,、uh, all of the information that they can to try to do what they're already doing and do it better. So one of the big problems they have is overcrowded buildings, buildings that have more people in them than, than they should, and that's illegal. Now they're always getting complaints for it, but how do you prioritize those complaints? 
You send an inspector to go there and take a look, and frankly, in about 13% about of times, he's going to have to issue a vacate order, which is the highest sort of order that they have, and it basically means yeah, everyone has to get out of the building within 24, 24 hours, because it's just so overcrowded. The problem with these buildings is that they're really dens of structural, uh, for dens ready to burst up into flames, just high correlation between those things. They don't know how to prioritize how to go to one building versus another because they're getting just so many complaints, tens of thousands of complaints a year, that may lead themselves to think that this is a, essentially a tenement. So what they do is they now take in all the data they can in a predictive model and come to some conclusions. So they take whether there's a lien on the property, whether there's been a utility cut, are there any rodent uh, complaints, right? And they look at it all into a huge model, whether there's been any exterior brickwork, and all together, they then are able to prioritize it. And now when an inspector goes to a building, they issue a vacate order 70% of the time. The model has increased their output fivefold. And as a result, there's fewer fires, fewer firemen who die in those fires. Think of big data as a government, as a user, in terms of public safety. Now we can have an open and generous debate about whether uh, the NSA, which collects so much information, is actually help, is, to what degree this is, allies with our values. Nevertheless, they perceive, and we as, as citizens, understand the importance to actually have uh, people to look after our safety. This has been big data for a long time. Of course, the interesting thing is that the tools are now being democratized, so that lots of people can do things that the NSA was able to do only 10 or 20 years ago. This is the NSA building on, in Fort Meade. This is another view of the NSA building in Fort Meade, which tells you that the world has changed a little bit. That's from Google Maps. But just being a user is part of it. Where we're seeing government also is being threatened by big data. So the first area that we're seeing it is in open data. Typically, government wants to open up the data because it's actually allowing us to do new things to become more efficient, just like we saw with public services. In the case of Britain, what the government did was very interesting. Because there's the National Health Service, they have all of this data. It's very easy for them to collect it for the entire population and then make it available if they wanted to. They made anonymous records available to a bunch of hackers. Two people who are actually friends to the Strata community, a woman named Fran and Bruce from Mastodon C. They're not here, unfortunately, today, but they've been at previous Stratas. They sort of just experimented and looked at lots of different things to see what they could find. After a lot of false leads, they looked at drug prescription based on location of where it was prescribed, and they struck pay dirt. What they found was in the case of a few drugs, and in this case, it's the case of statins, which is for lowering blood pressure, it turns out there's a wide variety of prescription practices. There's two sorts, some that are very expensive and patented, those that are generics and inexpensive, but the quality is the same for both of them, right? Well, as the map shows, in some areas in the north, people were prescribing one-third of the prescriptions for statins was gonna be the expensive branded stuff, and elsewhere in the country, it's much less, and it's not about the needs of the patient. So if you're the NHS and you want to save money, this is ideal for you. You actually know where to target your efforts. It doesn't tell you why they're doing this, right? It, it may not be because the drug rep is knocking on the door and giving some freebies or some kickbacks. It doesn't have to be that. It could just be simple prescriptioning practices. For example, maybe older doctors are up in the north, there's fewer people, and they just do what they're comfortable with and familiar with over the years. So there's nothing maybe criminal here, but it does show you that you can save money if you wanted to. And of course, states have always cared for an informational advantage, and they're threatened when they lose that. A few years ago, the uh, US government declassified Project Hexagon. <clears throat> this one satellite system was based on film and camera. It had 60 miles of film, acetate film, wound up in it. And after it took the photographs of the Soviet missile sites, it would package it up, oh so high up in space, and parachute it down to Earth. Now, of course, you're all thinking, okay, sure, it lands in the Pacific, and a boat comes, and it collects it. No, that's too easy. That, this is the earlier version of American espionage. These guys were cowboys. So the parachute would fly down, and a cargo plane would fly across the Pacific and swoop it up in midair. That's serious stuff. I mean, these guys had fun, okay? You felt the Cold War wasn't just, wasn't just about fretting over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some of the engineers uh, not only saved us from uh, peril, but also had a, had a wink of how they could do it, too. 
However, where we're headed to with big data now is going to be in terms of regulation. There's lots of areas where the state is going to want to stick its fingers. I want to look at four of them. The first one is antitrust. The second one is privacy. The third one is predictions and what it means for there to be a black box among all you uh, alchemists. And the last one is for that which shall not say its name, starts with a T, the word is taxes. Uh, get ready. So let's think about how the government might regulate big data if it wanted to. The most obvious area is going to be in antitrust, and we're seeing this already. An example is Google and what it's facing in terms of the European Union. Right? They are being raked over the coals by regulators in Europe because it, the regulators just don't know how to understand a market. They don't understand what it means that a market might be growing uh, by, uh, by leaps and bounds in a short period of time. You know, if, if, if the data that, if the scale of data that a company holds is doubling, does that mean the market size is doubling or that their power and dominance is doubling? Regulators just simply don't know these issues. So what they're trying to do is understand it, but what it seems like is that these ecosystems, these data ecosystems, resemble 19th century trusts. Now, at the earlier information infrastructure companies, like telecom companies, they had to be broken up, and they were broken up because they looked too big, and they were broken up, to, they were broken up in terms of structural separation, and they were, they were separated as well because they wanted to allow new entrants to come in. So typically, the structural separation looked like uh, the, the last mile, dealing with customers, and looking at the long-haul network that was dealing with just carrying the traffic and creating common carriage rules that you couldn't interfere with the traffic. I am not certain what the parallel is going to be for big data, but it does seem to me that there's going to be temptations to look at previous remedies on this new thing that we have called big data. Next, of course, is privacy. <clears throat> the way the system works today is what I'll characterize as a legal fiction, and it works like this. Take out your iPad, your iPhone, and you want to uh, purchase an app, and you have to give your consent for the information that it's going to collect. So first, you're given notice, and the notice is going to be about 80 different pages written in all caps that you have to s swipe through, and that's your informed notice. Then you say, I, I, you don't read it. You click on, I accept the terms and conditions, and that's your informed consent, and that is just completely ridiculous. I mean, it's actually a real credit to the information economy and to the, to the people who are participating in it that that actually has been learned to be accepted because by anyone's measure, it's just a preposterous notion. The courts know it, everybody knows it, but we all live with this. And I don't think that that's a good enough basis with which, with, for us to have a societal conversation and to protect privacy in the digital age. So this is going to be a second area where we're going to have to figure out how we answer this. And one answer might be going from, a, from regulating the collection of data to regulating the usage of data. Okay? Totally different. Hard to do, but it seems like the way things should go because it's just a lot more sensical. The third is hard to describe. We don't even have a language for it. But if you will, the technology is not just moving from the, the the issue that we're facing is not just simply privacy, but it's also propensity. That is to say, algorithms are going to be making predictions about things that we have not yet done, and we're going to be penalized based on those predictions. So we know in Minority Report what the prediction was, was committing a crime, and a person was sent away before he had actually acted. Strange and jurisprudence that you would penalize prior to the committing of an act. But what happens in the future when you want insurance premiums and the rates are high or you're denied coverage because of your propensity, your, your, a prediction that you will get ill, of some sort of disease? What does it mean if you are denied a bank loan or any other sort of adverse scenario with you and business based on a prediction? If somebody wants to make a legitimate claim of action against a company saying, hey, I think I was wronged by this, what evidence is the company going to present? Well, let's think about it. The way it works today, if you knock on the door of Experian or FICO and say, hey, I was, I was given really high rates for a car loan, um, and I don't think I deserve it, they're going to say, well, here's the explicit rules. Here's how the system works in terms of how we scored your credit profile. Makes perfect sense. Sounds great. What's the problem? OK, big data. Let's say there's 10,000 variables. Let's say it's a machine learning algorithm that adapts over time. What is the person going to say? Oh. Um, 
you know, I could give you the formula. It changes a lot at the time, but I can sort of, I froze it at every stage because we did a kind of remote backup, and it's going to take you 60, it's just 60 pages of Greek, right? Even I can't understand what it is. Yeah, there's, some, there's, about, there's about 13 strong signals, but there's about 3,500 weak signals that determined what was this person's, you know, credit rating. You're simply not going to be able to do that, and that's going to be a serious problem. So not only will we see it in terms of predictive policing, which is live, but we'll see that in terms of business too. And the final issue is accounting and taxation. Imagine if the SEC required companies to break out its data and put it as a line in the balance sheet like they would physical assets or any other assets. Would you be able to do it? How could you do it? Would you be held liable for doing that, right? What if you needed, because you, once you value it, what if you had to insure against a loss of it? How would the insurance company set the premiums? What sort of standards would you have to adhere to to be accepted and approved for coverage, right? What, you're, what we're seeing is that an entire infrastructure of professionals is probably going to be need to be created to value data because data is, as we agree, the oil of the information economy, a new raw material of business. The book that Ed alluded to, I've just finished writing, and there we talk about a new professional that we coined the term the algorithmist. And what is the algorithmist? Well, if you think of an earlier information explosion in the beginning of the 19th century, when we had financial disclosure reporting rules on companies, we created and professionalized accountants and auditors. Accountants looking inside the company of what the books looked like, auditors serving as a surveillance function, a supervisory function on top of that. And we might go the same way now with this. Already one country in Europe, I'm not going to say which one, out of mercy and politeness and respect. I won't disclose which country. But a European country that begins with an F and ends with an E has issued a report that said that they're that, looking at the potentiality of how we, would, we might want to tax data. So look out, OK? So what do we do? I think there's four things that need to be uh, given great emphasis. The first one is to government that you need to engage with them early and often. That is to say, the reason why Intel did very well in the 90s of, not, of escaping the antitrust uh, thorn while Microsoft was bludgeoned by it was because they constantly had an open dialogue with the regulators in Washington in terms of what their flight path was, what the pipeline looked like. And so the regulators felt comfortable. So if you feel like this is an issue, engage with people. Have the conversation. The second thing is to your peers, to your competitors, there really should be a sort of armistice. In other industries, in the case of uh, the, the airline industry, it's agreed, there's a gentleman's agreement that you're not going to uh, advertise and market yourself based on safety because it's going to hurt everyone. However, some companies are starting to market and, and fight against others based on regulatory uh, standards. And I think that's going to actually hurt everyone as well. So I would say that just as we have some sports that play a muscular game where it's okay to check against the boards, we should allow this space for this community to play a vibrant competitive game of capitalism, but not try to tell tales to the teacher and try to get mama to kind of separate us. That, I think, is going to undermine all of the great things that we're doing. The third one is to the media. I think it's important that you lead the societal conversation by engaging with the media. And the last one is to consumers. Just try to be responsible. It sounds ridiculous, but you all are consumers as well as technologists, and so you have an interest in this as well. Please remember that regulators don't want to just do the wrong thing. Sometimes they just have rules that they have to uphold. And for every person who feels that they have some strange thing that they have to deal with, like Neil Armstrong disclosing and declaring to a customs forum his moon rock samples, there's also a regulator who probably didn't want to sign the forum who had to sign it as well. Exactly. I want to thank you very much. I look forward to having this conversation with all of you in the years ahead. Thanks.